Hi everyone, my name is Monique Casanova and welcome to What's the Scope? This is a new initiative for students hosted by Easter Engineering Group where the students get to pick out a structure and we contact the team that worked on the project and we ask them if they are willing to answer the students' technical and design questions. Um, yesterday we had our very first interview with the 1000 Museum and our interns got the chance to meet Chris Lapine from Saha Date Architects and Luis Ramirez from Desimone Engineering. I think you're going to really enjoy it. We were very excited and check it out. Good morning, Mr. Lapine and Mr. Ramirez and to all of the attendees. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with Nico and I to answer our questions about 1000 Museum. I appreciate you both in teaching us more about the architecture and structural engineering fields, specifically involving the creation of the 1000 Museum and sharing your expertise in these fields. My name is Shannon Stever and I am entering my senior year of my undergraduate studies in civil engineering at Florida International University, FIU, here in Miami. 1000 Museum is a structure in Miami that I have always admired and I'm really excited to learn more and hear your guys' input. So, good morning, Mr. Lapine and Mr. Ramirez, as well as to all the other attendees that are watching. First and foremost, I wanted to say thank you for giving us the time and the opportunity because we do understand that you guys have very busy schedules, and especially now during these difficult times. My name is Nicholas Vega and I'm currently a high school senior and finishing the dual enrollment program at Miami Dade College, where I'll be receiving my associate's degree. Essentially, I'll be graduating with both my high school diploma and my first two years of my college education. Following this, I'll be completing my bachelor's degree in civil engineering at Florida International University. Now, the reason I chose the 1000 Museum is because the building is one of a kind and it raised multiple questions on the actual structure and design of its undulating exoskeleton. For an up and coming civil engineer, this interview will clear up a lot of questions for not only myself, but for other current students as well. So without further ado, whenever you guys are ready, we can start the questions. Oh my God, guys, I am so sorry I'm joining so late. <laughs> welcome, Luis, welcome, Chris. My name is Monique. Um, we're very excited about this interview. Hi, Nico, hi, Shannon, I am so sorry. <laughs> no I don't know what happened. Um, but, okay, so everybody, welcome to What's the Scope? We are talking about the 1000 Museum today. We have Luis Ramirez, which is, he is gonna be the engineer on record for this project uh, from Des Desimone Engineers. And we also have Chris Lapine from Saha Hadid. Um, you guys, thank you so much for taking the time to answering uh, these cool questions that the kids have for you. And with no further ado, you guys can start your questions. Sure, thanks. Sure. Just one little correction. It's actually Chris Lapine, but um, it's all right. I, I, ever, since, ever since growing up, my first day at, uh, uh, in any school when they were taking attendance, it was Chris Lapine. So I, I, I always would say then, you know, oh, no, it's actually Chris Lapine. But uh, anyway, there we go. <laughs> no, I apologize and thank you. <laughs> we wanted no to ask you, but with all of this, um, in, I don't know, these like problems I was having, we completely forgot. So Chris Lapine, so nice to meet you. And Louis, so nice to meet you as well. Um, Nico and Shannon have very cool questions. So I'll let you guys go ahead and start. All right. So my first question is for Chris. Um, considering this is the first structure Zaha Hadid created for the West, did this have an effect on the design? Uh, it wasn't actually the first structure. It's the first um tower in the in the western hemisphere of this uh scale we have um, other projects in the u.s but um yeah this certainly is our uh, uh first tower um it was uh I, I guess a special project for us not only because it being our first tower here but um miami was like zaha's second home so she spent a lot of time in miami she had a very close-knit circle of friends um her place, she she had a place in Miami at the uh, W, um, and from one of the corners of her balcony, you could, she could actually see the site. So you can actually see the tower from where she um, used to live when she was in Miami. So in that sense, it made it, it was it was a very important project, a very special project. And of course, um, I guess the pressure was on to make sure that we did something that was uh, both spectacular and at the same time, um, something that would... Um, you know, certainly be uh, befitting a, a, a design and structure that Zaha would want to see there. Okay, perfect. 
Well, it definitely is spectacular. The building is absolutely amazing. And every time any of us are driving downtown, it's just such an iconic view. So it was, your vision was accomplished. <laughs> yeah, it really does stand out. I, uh, just a little story, um, you know, when we were first uh, starting this project, it was one of our first or second meetings, even with the client. The client was driving down Biscayne Boulevard and what it used to be a petrol station there, the BP uh, petrol station. And as we were approaching, he said, he just sort of looked over at me and said, imagine in a few years, you're going to see this uh, exoskeleton structure coming up and, um, you know, just, just think about what that's going to be like. Yeah, no, for sure. It's absolutely amazing. Um, was there significance in the placement of the building near the ocean? Um, I mean, or just in, in Miami in general to like complement the surrounding high rises? Uh, I mean, well, the, it was the site um, that the uh, owner had procured. Um, so we, we didn't have much uh, opportunity to select the site itself. It was, it was one that the client identified as uh, something they wanted to do, uh, a, a special building. And I think, um, you know, projects like this, that also takes a, a, a client who's willing to do something different. And um, I think they recognized they had a special site because it was on the bay. It had excellent views over the bay and, and to, the, to the beach beyond. Um, uh, they were taking a risk to do a structure like this uh, because the units um, themselves are luxury units. They're about uh, at least three or four times larger than um, any of the units in the nearby towers. So they were going also for a different market. So although um, we didn't have any real say in the location of the tower, we were very excited that it was um, in that spot because it is very prominent on the Miami skyline and it is, I think, an excellent location for a residential tower. True. For sure, I agree. Prominent it is. So, Chris, I have another question for you. Um, was the exoskeleton and the remaining exterior of the building designed before or after the interior space? And by interior space, I mean the, the residential units. Um, well, the, I, I guess everything sort of um, evolves together, but you know, the, the exoskeleton was the, the main feature. It was, um, uh, I mean, we, we knew the sort of shape, volume, and envelope that we had to fit within. Um, a lot of those are givens depending on how much area you're actually allowed to build on a site, what the height restrictions are, uh, and what the proportions and dimensions of the building can be when you take into account setbacks from the roads and adjacent buildings. So that gives you a general envelope. So we knew, um, uh, I guess, the sort of um, boundaries that we had to work within and the units that were created were either a half floor or a full floor. But the structure itself, we always saw that as, um, a, I guess there were many um, aspects to it. It was a key feature, a key design feature, but it also allowed us to um, create more open plan uh, uh, residential spaces. Um, and within the residential spaces themselves, you really get a sense of the structure coming up. So when you're, when you look out of the balcony, it's always, the views are always framed by the structure. So it's, it's even though it's an external, uh, I guess, key design element, it's something that you sense wherever you are within the building. Of course. Um, my next question is for Mr. Ramirez. How does the structure's exoskeleton affect the ability of the building to withstand hurricane wind forces? Forces, forces, forces. Being that, Being that I imagine that the yeah, upper part the is upper more vulnerable, more to, vulnerable to hurricane forces since the bottom part is reinforced more by the exoskeleton. What difficulties did this present? So when we first started the building, um, you know, there were a number of concepts that uh, Chris and, uh, and company had uh, come up with. Um, and while the exoskeleton was evolving, uh, we um, sized up a traditional framing system uh, for the building, being shear walls and some internal columns. Um, 
So we had initially sized the, the central core to do all of the work, right? While the exoskeleton was was evolving, um, you know, once the once a, a few more iterations had come through um, of the exoskeleton, uh, then we started taking advantage of those um, and removing shear wall where we could, right? Um, so you know where you can see the exoskeleton. Um, uh, with uh, pronounced angles, uh, that's where the exoskeleton is doing the bulk of the work, and uh, and the shear walls are doing very little, right? Um, so we took advantage of that, and we removed the walls in those locations. Now, once you get up, uh, I believe it's past the, if I remember correctly, it's the uh, the 37th floor. The exoskeleton starts to be more vertical. So there, the bulk of the work is being done by the shear walls. So it was always, um, there was never any, um, the, our restrictions were really about how much wall we could pull out, not about how much wall we could find, uh, because we initially sized the, the shear walls to do all the work, right? So then it was just finding uh, economies uh, and making the building uh, as, uh, economical as possible while still maintaining uh, uh, Zaha Hadid's uh, vision for the building. Awesome. So continuing on the topic of the, the building's exoskeleton, I have another question. Uh, how was the exoskeleton input into the structural analysis of the building? So we used, uh, we used two programs uh, from the uh, CSI analysis suite, CSI being Computer Structures uh, Incorporated or Industries, I forget exactly what CSI stands for, but we used ETABS and SAP. Uh, and so uh, Chris's team built uh, a 3D model using Rhino uh, and um, while they were building it, we asked them to model, uh, to include center lines of the exoskeleton. Uh, and then what happened was from Rhino, we could extract a, uh, a 3D CAD file called the DXF. Uh, and from that DXF, uh, we could input that directly into ETABS uh, and then start assigning properties uh, in ETABS. Uh, so we got the true geometry uh, directly from the architect uh, straight into uh, into our computer analysis. And so we used the sorry. So we used both pieces of software, both ETABS and SAP, uh, as a check against each other. Uh, you know, there are certain limitations in ETABS, so we used SAP as a check against that. SAP is more of a uh, general three D analysis. Uh, program that can be applied to any sort of structure. Um, how were the engineers able to eliminate so many columns in the interior space? Um, we have, like, I have read online that by adding two inches to the floor slabs, the engineers were, were able to downsize to only two internal columns, allowing for spans up to 45 feet. How did this, as well as the exoskeleton, affect the weight of the building and the foundation of the structure? Since adding two inches of concrete I'm, per floor, I imagine that it would be have a significant change in the weight of the structure. Uh, certainly, um, certainly has an impact on the on the weight of the building. Uh, but for us, it was actually a positive thing. Um, so, one to answer the first part of your question: How we um, how we managed to achieve the spans uh, and only have two internal columns. Uh, so one of the slabs are post-tension slabs. Um, that's one. Uh, and then two, uh, we used the cantilevers uh, to help us achieve internal long spans uh, by creating a balance uh, of interior of interior span mechanical conditions. Um, so that allowed us to, to span um, up to 45 feet from the core, right? So we have an 11 inch post tension slab uh, throughout the building. Um, so that's the first part of your question, uh, the impacts to the weight of the building. So the challenge with any concrete building and designing concrete buildings is, uh, at least for us, is how to resolve uh, 
tensions in uh, in concrete elements. Concrete is uh, by nature a brittle material uh, and works fantastic in compression, uh, but not so great in tension. Right. Um, so having the the additional weight uh, on the building uh, from the two inches in the in each slab helped us to counteract a lot of the tensions. Uh, tension forces that we saw in the exoskeleton uh, and in the core, um, uh, you know, to, and that would, we still ended up with uh, some net tensions, uh, but that would, but that allowed us to uh, uh, fit the amount of steel that was needed uh, in some of these elements. Uh, now, if you see some of the pictures online of construction, you're going to see that you can barely see any daylight through some of these elements. Uh, because they they do have lots and lots of steel in them in some sections, uh, but uh, not sure how would, how that would have been achieved uh, if we didn't have uh, the additional weight uh, from the building. Okay. Uh, uh, and the the weight on the foundations. So the foundations weren't really affected too much by the weight of the building because the foundations are really set more uh, because of the adjacent buildings that we have nearby, right? Uh, the owners of this site, uh, or excuse me, one of the owners of this site is also one of the owners of 10 Museum Park, uh, which is the building immediately to the north of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, we wanted to make sure, now that building is only 40 stories tall, um, so a lot shorter than, uh, than our building here. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that uh, that the weight of the building and any settlement uh, didn't negatively impact the neighboring building. So we have piles uh, that go down as deep as 165 feet, um, and that's really to control the amount of settlement uh, and minimize the impacts on the neighboring building, 10 Museum Park, and also the, um, the metro mover uh, that is directly to the west. So another question for you, Mr. Ramirez, is considering that the building is 699 feet tall and is likely to feel movement and dynamic forces, how did you change, how did you design for this movement to maintain a stable structure? Uh, so, well, we took advantage of the exoskeleton, right? Uh, the exoskeleton really provided a tremendous amount of rigidity uh, to the building. Right? Uh, now, all buildings... Uh, are supposed to move. Uh, you know, there, there's no building that is not going to move, um, uh, especially a high rise uh, in any wind event, whether it be down in Miami uh, or in New York, um, wherever it may be. Um, so there, um, all we did, uh, again, because the exoskeleton was so stiff and provided so much rigidity, um, we had. Uh, we were not challenged at all with uh, controlling the movements. Uh, it was all about, uh, again, going back to the original point, which is uh, looking for economies and taking out as much shear wall as we could. Um, uh, so that was really the balance is how, how much wall we could take out and still satisfy all the criteria, right? The strength design and the serviceability design. Um, my next question, um, is for Chris. My question is, did the geometry change throughout the design process as the structural engineers evaluated the architect's design? And does the design of the building complement the aesthetics and the frame? Yes, actually, um, the overall design um, uh, changed remarkably little, actually, over the um, course of it in the early concept days to when it got built. Uh, the basic premise of the exoskeleton was established fairly early. Um, how it, I, I guess, came together at the different node points where the structure comes together and then um, bifurcates again. Um, those were. Uh, I guess that early image persisted through uh, the design process. So when we looked at this uh, in the very early days, the idea was always to 
really express express the structure, make um, I guess integrate structure and architecture uh, to have a very fluid looking structure that um, you know was uh, both the architectural uh, I guess um, intent. Uh, but was faithful to how the structure worked, how the structural forces came came down th through the through the building. Um, it did. I mean, we we built a very detailed three D model, and as Lewis uh, mentioned, we exchanged a lot of three D da data throughout the process. So that also helped us keep on course with, um, I guess, the confidence to go forward with our design to know that it worked. Uh, it did get massaged i guess you could say um so we we did move certain um i guess elements around to align with the floors so that we could get a perfect correlation between where the floors occurred where the structure came together and also the thicknesses of the structure so uh you know what lewis touched on um and uh, earlier was the you know getting these large spans and if you look at our design, you can see how the structure becomes thicker or wider through the middle portion when the structure itself, I mean, I guess it, it does this sort of V shape. And when it does that at its widest point, the spans were too great. So uh, we increased the width of the structure and that reduced the, the span. So when you look at the, the overall, it, the structural expression is a direct response to all the different conditions that we had to engineer, all the different conditions that we had to design. Um, and my next question goes back to um, to Lewis. How exactly was the exoskeleton made? As in, like, what materials were used and how was it reinforced? Oh, your microphone is muted. Um, so, uh, the, um, when Chris, when we first, uh, started talking about the project, right, and talking about materials, um, one thing that was always consistent was the, um, the color of the concrete, uh, that, uh, uh that Chris and team, uh, envisioned for the project, right? So uh, when we first started looking at this, uh, we said, okay, how do we achieve white concrete uh, in, a, in an economical manner or a light concrete? So we, um, the two options that we came up with, or really the two options that were available was one, using uh, traditional cast in place concrete uh, using, um, light aggregate materials in the concrete mix um, and uh, and using a form of traditional formwork uh, for the uh, for the execution of the exoskeleton uh, the other was uh, using left in place forms um, and so the left in place forms were uh, would have would end up being made out of uh, GFRC material, GFRC meaning uh, glass fiber reinforced concrete. Uh, so they mocked up uh, both options. Uh, and in addition to uh, mocking up uh, you know, what the final product would look like, uh, they also looked at the impacts on using um, each type of uh, construction methods on the schedule and cost to the project, right? Um, we had one contractor from the Chicago area uh, that, uh, that was going to come into Miami, um, and they did a full-scale mock-up of one of the nodes. Um, the the mock-up looked fantastic. Uh, you know, it... Uh, it achieved a color that was acceptable to uh, to the architect. Uh, but then when they chased out what it would mean to actually build uh, the building using uh, traditional techniques, uh, it was a, 
it extended the schedule out significantly. Uh, and then when they compared that to what the schedule would be using uh, GFRC form work, uh, the delta between the two schedules was a, a little over six months. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a big deal for, uh, for a developer because that just means, um, one, it's taken him longer to get uh, the building completed. Uh, two, that means that the owner is carrying their construction loan for six months longer. Uh, so that's a lot of interest uh, that owners have to pay um, without, having, without actually generating any uh, new income uh, for the building. Uh, so at the end of the day, schedule one out, um, and, uh, and we ended up choosing the GFRC system. Uh, the GFRC system, um, those panels were uh, manufactured in Dubai, uh, and I'm sure you can, uh, there's lots of images online, uh, and also from, uh, from some of the articles that, uh, that both uh, Zaha and De Simone have uh, collaborated on. Um, and what really what the, these molds, or excuse me, these formworks would, uh, would be built in a factory in Dubai, put into shipping containers, uh, and then shipped across the Atlantic. Uh, gosh, I think from, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but from the time that they were manufactured to the time they ended up on site, it was, uh, I want to say it was roughly a, a three-month process uh, for each one of these panels, right? So a lot of these um, the panels were built uh, well in advance of when they were actually needed on the construction site. So that way they could uh, have a stockpile of, uh, of formwork panels um, on site and they could be uh, you know, repaired if needed uh, any, uh, to, uh, due to any damage that may have been, that may have occurred during the shipping process. Um, so what you end up with uh, is a uh, is a a structure that when you walk by, uh, which maybe uh, hopefully some of you have, and you can touch and feel the building, it's actual concrete. Uh, uh, it's just not the uh, the actual structural element, uh, but they were, um, but they ultimately delivered on uh, the vision that. Uh, that, that Chris and his team had and allowed us to, you know, come up with all of the funky shapes, uh, you know, that you see today. So I'm so sorry. Um, so you're saying it's not the structural element. So the, the, the GFRC that you see yeah. is left in place formwork. So what you have is, uh, it's, form work uh, that is filled with uh, with rebar um, uh, and then filled in with concrete. Uh, so the interior sections of the, the GFRC form work, those dimensions, that's what's in our uh, computer model. Uh, and uh, so the final shapes are actually bigger than uh, than what we analyzed. We analyzed the actual structural elements that are within the interior of the uh, of that GFRC enclosure, yeah. and they're all cast in together. Okay, that's interesting. Nico, do you have another question? Yeah. So, okay, taking a step back, after conducting some research, we found that the One Thousand Museum has its own private rooftop helipad. So was this building code requirement or was this an owner requirement? Um, no, it, it's no, no code requirement. The uh, building owner uh, really wanted to have a helipad, which added a lot of complexity to resolving the top of the tower because there's a lot of um, mechanical systems and everything else that have to fit up there as well as we have a very uh, special event space, the, the feature space at the top of the tower. So um, incorporating helipad also meant that nothing could be higher than the helipad itself. So it pretty much gave us the sort of final height of the tower and everything had to fit below that. But it, it, it's, a, it's a nice feature. Uh, it is, um, I think, uh, the 
the client was insistent all the way through, um, even when we had discussions about, you know, budget related issues, well, let's just drop the helipad and save some money. But uh, no, they wouldn't have it. They needed that. They wanted that helipad. So it <laughs> remained. It persisted all the way from day one. In fact, none of us believed it would ever make it all the way through to construction, but it did. <laughs> so it's there. Awesome. Well, awesome. it definitely makes it very luxurious as well. <laughs> yes. You can arrive by helipad. <laughs> you guys know that um, David Beckham bought the penthouse, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. We, um, uh, we, we saw some of the tabloid um, articles. Uh, and I talked to the client about it because we were all curious when David Beckham and, you know, when, when the Beckhams were going to close on the deal and, you know, he's, he, everything had to be sort of hush hush for them. But, you know, apparently they had paparazzi hiding in the bushes across the street. They would just jump out and photograph them and stuff. Uh, it was a, a while in the making. It was about sort of two to three months between the time it was first reported to the time they actually closed. But um, we were quite excited to to learn that they did, ultimately purchased the, the the top floor of the um at the, of the tower so it's nice publicity for for us as well yeah for sure <laughs> pretty exciting um do you guys have more questions shannon and nico uh yeah i have a question um uh, kind of directed to both mr ramirez and mr mr lapine um how were you as architects and engineers able to coordinate on such a large and complex project? I assume it, it was no easy feat. So how, how were you able to like coordinate well? Um, I mean, maybe I can start because it, it, it is, it's always hard to coordinate um, even on a simple project and on a project like this with its complexity, but also the geographic distance between us. We were in London. De Simone was in Miami. Um, I would, and some of my team would make occasional trips, maybe once every six weeks for a period of time. Uh, during those face-to-face -face meetings, we, we, we did a lot. But um, in between, um, we would have to have uh, a lot of phone conferences, uh, but you know, really the exchange of digital files, especially the 3D model, it was very detailed. And that allowed us to uh, make sure that um, the architecture and the structure were, were coordinated. Awesome. awesome. I have yeah. a question though. I think, are you Lewis in New York though? Were you, did you have to make some trips here too or? Uh, well, I'm in New York today. Uh, oh. Actually, as of 2016, uh, okay. I'm, back to New York, uh, but during the during this project, I lived in Miami. I lived in Miami from 2005 to 2016. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, we were actually wondering if you guys had to make trips here. Um, we know that throughout the project, communication is so important. So we were kind of like figuring it out, like we wanted to know. Right, yeah, no, I mean, I wanted to make trips to London, uh, but uh, <laughs> That's why I didn't want to pay for that. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but as far as uh, you know, our coordination uh, with uh, between De Simone and uh, and Zaha's office, um, certainly lots of uh, markup, digital markups, uh, <clears throat> markups on the three D files, um, exchanges of drawings. Um, I think while we were, you know, it's. I wonder what the process would have been like uh, if it were um, uh, if it were today, uh, because um, back then screen sharing wasn't that very very popular, right? Uh, as as much as it is today, or even in the last uh, in the last uh, year or so, um, and I suspect that you know as great as uh, as great as the communication was between our offices, um, you know, I think had it been done today, it would have been, it would have even been smoother, uh, you know, uh, being able to communicate, to coordinate live uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, emailing Chris and his team something at 5 p.m. Uh, and then getting a response from him at, uh, or from his team at, uh, you know, nine o'clock the next morning or whatever it is uh because of the time difference uh, yeah 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 sure 
my last question is as for Chris. Um, what would you say is the most was the most challenging aspect of designing the one thousand museum? Um, well, you know the the main feature is the uh, the the structure, the exoskeleton. That's where uh, most of the time and energy was spent um, to get that resolved, to get it looking right, because it had to perform on many different levels. It was aesthetic. It was architectural, it was structural, the technical aspects of it, how it was built, um, all of that had to be resolved simultaneously. So, um, and, you know, to get that from, you know, starting with an initial vision all the way to a completed structure is, is, is quite a task because anywhere along the way it can get derailed. Um, and I just add a little bit to Lewis's story about the, you know, how we, how we built this thing. Um, and when we were uh, designing this, um, you know, nobody really had an idea of how we could truly build it. Um, we had experience on previous projects where we'd used this technique, the permanent formwork technique, and we knew we, it could work. But you know, knowing it can work and convincing a client as well as a contractor to try something that's never been done before in the world that's another big, big ask. So uh, I think the stars really aligned on this one because one of the big investors in the project was familiar with this technique and was willing to um, buy into it and, and gave everyone sort of a level of comfort. So, you know, the, the, the challenge both in the design, but also I guess keeping true to the design all the way to the end was, you know, uh, uh, I think really the, the biggest component of it so you know I'd, I'd have to say that was where um that was the challenge that um i think that had to be uh, uh appropriately uh dealt with appropriately um resolved and uh, I, I think we're we're all quite happy that that it was that it came out the way we had designed it awesome um i know we have like some last questions lined for you guys um we do have 10 minutes so feel free to let us know whenever you need to um leave the um the interview but uh since there are a lot of students um that are going to be watching this and we're so involved with all the students from fiu i wanted both of you guys' input um i see that you both have your master's degree um, I, from your experience, um, what was your experience of getting your bachelor's and then getting your master's? Did you guys kind of like worked in between? Did you graduate with your bachelor and then went straight for your master's or how did that kind of work in your experience? So I know that, um, well, I had been given advice really early on, um, even when I graduated, uh, well, when I graduated high school, uh, back in 93, um, having a, um, uh, having a bachelor's degree, even back then, uh, was essentially no better than, uh, than having a high school degree. Right. So, uh, at least on the engineering side, uh, or on the structural engineering side. Um, so I knew, uh, from, uh, before I even started my bachelor's, uh, that getting a master's was a was really a mandate for me uh, if I wanted to end up at a uh, end up doing the type of work that uh, that I've been so blessed with, uh, you know, being able to to do. Um, so, um, you know, a master's degree was always mandatory. Uh, and uh, and certainly at De Simone, uh, I'd say ninety to ninety five percent of the people that we have uh, of our engineers, they all have uh, master's degrees. Um, every once in a while, you know, we'll um, you know through internships or whatever the uh, the case may be, we come across folks that uh, that just stand out. Uh, and we'll take chances with them, uh, hiring them uh, without having their master's degrees, uh, but uh, with the caveat that, uh, that within a certain number of years, they will have their master's degrees. Um, so I can tell you on the, on the structural engineering side, there's just uh, an additional uh, 
level of exposure and uh, and analysis uh, coursework uh, that you take um, that we feel is um, at least at De Simone uh, extremely important for uh, for people to uh, to gain uh, and to be exposed to. Uh, so um, you know it. I can't uh, strongly, strongly encourage uh, young students, especially today, uh, because the competition is so tough out there. Uh, you know that uh, that you really have to get your master's degree, uh, and you know uh, go through those extra thesis projects uh, to make yourself stand out uh, amongst the competition, uh, because there's lots and lots of uh, great. Uh, engineers out there uh, so um, you, know, you always have to find a way to uh, to, to not uh, not become part of the noise so to speak you're right I agree what do you think Chris yeah so um, yes I, I um, have a master's degree in architecture and I think you know, really it's I think there's two traditional ways to, to, to go about it there's a three plus two um, degree, uh, and then there's a uh, four-year undergraduate degree and a two-year master's degree to get your uh, master's of architecture, which, you know, is, you know, to, to become professionally accredited as an architect, um, it, it's almost a, um, a requirement to have a master's of architecture. I didn't do either of those traditional approaches. I actually got my undergraduate degree in finance, so um, I took a, a really wow. different different route uh, but I went through what was called a post baccalaureate so um, it is sort of like a compressed uh, uh, undergraduate degree in architecture that where I then went on to the two-year master's degree so I was in school maybe a, a little bit longer but I do have two completely different degrees um, I def decided to follow my creative instincts and my dreams of architecture. So I it, it did a big sort of swerve in that direction. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I, I got my master's degree, never looked back. And, you know, I always knew that I wanted to pursue a, a career where I was able to do such uh, extraordinary buildings. And you know, I'm very happy that, that, that I was able to do that. It's not many careers that you're able to do something like that. So um, I'm quite happy I was. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, I do want to ask you, um, did you guys, just because I've noticed these are kind of like common comments of um, students that graduate with a civil engineering degree, I've noticed that they say it's very theoretical and then once they go into like the workplace, they start kind of like relating things. So would you recommend maybe getting a little bit of experience and then going into your master's or just like straight to your master's or what do you think? So uh, my recommendation is that you uh, always go straight to your master's. Uh, now people have uh, done both ways and been successful both ways. Um, I just know from my personal experience uh, that uh, you know, that life comes at you really quickly uh, and, you know, lots of different things that you have to tackle, um, not necessarily related to uh, to work. Uh, so, you know, the longer you wait, the more difficult it is uh, because you just start gaining more responsibilities, right? Uh, you know, you may end up starting a family or, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, so just uh, you have more challenges. Um, I think if you you end up having more challenges if you if you wait a little bit longer. Uh, now I didn't. Uh, uh, I was fortunate enough that um, that the master's program that I did uh, was really a, it, um, was a, a night based program, uh, more geared towards uh, towards working individuals. So um, so I was working and getting my master's um, at the same time. Um, you know, um, no, that's so. awesome. Definitely another option. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Uh, but again, but I, but I think if I had just, just started working myself, uh, and waited to get my master's, uh, I think, uh, I think it, it would have been, uh, more difficult for me, at least, uh, you know, under my personal circumstances. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, Shannon and Nico, do you guys have any other questions? Did we miss any or? Uh, no, all the questions personally have been answered. Okay. Um, well, Luis and Chris, if you guys are ever in town, please, you have our emails, let us know. We'll be happy to buy you a Starbucks. And I know we have a million more questions. We've seen all the structures that you've done and they're just absolutely spectacular. We are fans of structures. So if you're ever in town, let us know. And we do want to thank you for taking the time. We were very excited to meet you and we're very happy with all the answers that you gave us. I don't know if you maybe have any questions for Shannon and Nico or. Uh, no, I mean, uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm glad we were able to, uh, uh, to be here to meet with you. Um, good luck with your careers, everyone. Um, uh, you know, you have a, a bright, promising future ahead of you. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad if we can provide any sort of uh, inspiration or indication how to go about it. Um, I hope we're able to, uh, I guess, it, it explain uh, one particular structure and, you know, you know, even give an indication of how our career career paths ended up taking us here. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, uh, I'm one, the fact that you guys wanted to reach out to us uh, and ask, you know, uh, engage in this conversation says a lot about, uh, about you guys. Um, I don't know. That. Me personally, <laughs> I would have thought of this. Uh, it would have uh, certainly helped me, uh, but I think it says a lot about you guys uh, and uh, and the type of career paths uh, that are in front of you, and uh, certainly a uh, an insight into uh, I think how successful you guys are going to be uh, and being proactive and getting this advice uh, so early on in your careers. So uh, kudos to you guys. Thank yes, very true. Shannon and Nico are very brilliant. <laughs> All right, I see that we have a couple of questions somebody made on the chat. What I'm going to do is I'll just filter them out and see if uh, Luis and Chris are willing to answer them via email. And I think this will be the end of our interview. Thank you, everybody. So nice to meet you, Luis and Chris. And like I said, if you're ever in town, be sure to contact us. Sure yeah. thing. Yeah, All right. Thank you again. Bye, guys. everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Chris, we'll be talking. Yes, we will. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Bye.